Well, hello everyone. I hope the conference is going well. Thank you for joining my session. I, uh, I work for Deloitte, but I haven't been here very long. Is there any other ones? Turning it off in a minute. How's that better? Okay. Um, I work for Deloitte. I haven't been working for Deloitte very long. I'm actually a naval officer, retired Navy. I will speak up. I'm used to doing that. Um, retired naval officer of 30 years, um, surface warfare officer, ship guy, uh, command of a small ship and a bigger ship and then a squad. Um, but I was also a subspecialty in information technology, a master's uh, in a good place to be. I got my undergrad at the Naval Academy, my master's in information technology at the Naval Postgraduate School and my CIO certification at uh, National Defense University. Uh, so that's sort of my subspecialty world in the Navy. And so when I, when I wasn't on a ship operating a ship, I was ashore uh, managing information technology and continuity of operations. Um, and so I have some, some lessons learned around incident response that I'll share with you in that regard. Um, I was also in charge of continuity of operations of the National Military Command Center in the Pentagon. And unfortunately, I was there on 9-11. So we had to think about whether we were going to coop continuity of operations shift up to our little mini Cheyenne Mountain, which was up in Pennsylvania. Um, it was a very uh, difficult experience. Uh, but we were able to ensure that the NMCC, as they call it, which sends out orders to all military forces, was able to continue its operations despite what had happened. So later in my career, I was chief of staff of the 10th Fleet, Fleet Cyber Command. 10th Fleet is the Navy's cyber fleet. The Navy had recognized early on the importance, not really early on, it was actually 2010, the importance of cyber in warfare, and so they stood up uh, Fleet Cyber Command, 10th Fleet, which is a numbered fleet, just like 7th Fleet, 5th Fleet, uh, and they put a three-star on top of that. That was Mike Rogers, who's the director of the NSA now, uh, and I was his chief of staff at 10th Fleet. So um, that was my last tour in the Navy, and during that tour, and we'll talk about this a little bit, we were significantly hacked by a nation-state actor, advanced persistent threat. It was ugly. Um, and so we'll talk about sort of the planning around that, uh, what worked, what didn't work, uh, and give you some insight as to incident response plans as I work with today, which is in the commercial side. I am, uh, my, my role at Deloitte is uh, incident response and cyber war gaming and technical resilience activities in the commercial space. Um, and so I've been doing that now uh, just about two years. I have been involved in some of the more significant public hacks that you've seen in the news. Um, when I was hired at Deloitte, I was actually sent out this way for six months uh, in November of 2014 for a very significant hack on a company that is located in Los Angeles. Um, so that was a very eyes wide open exposure to the commercial world. Uh, so I, I feel like I have good but I don't have all the answers here. I'm not a tech, I'm an operator. Um, and what, what I hope you'll get out of this is that um, incident response plans and the success of incident response is truly not a technology issue. It's not one to be run by the technologists necessarily. It's a supporting, supported relationship. Are there any military in the audience? Sorry. Retired what? Air Force. Air Force. Excellent. Thank you for your service. 
Do you know what this is? Challenge point. So a challenge point, I had this made it when I got to the way, because they didn't have any challenge points. I'm a military guy, I have to have a challenge point. Although they wouldn't let me personalize it, our quality review folks said no. So, but this has all of the armed forces around the outside, because I'm a veteran, I asked for that flag, deploy it. My challenge, so what, what you do is when you visit a command, commanding officer puts this in his hand, you and I would come up, you would shake my hand, and turn it over, and you would take that coin. <laughs> <laughs> this coin is a sign of trust and respect, and cooperation, and all those good words between commands. My challenge to you is the most interactive, most interesting person in this room. I will give this challenge point to. So uh, I hope you get a lot out of this. And I'm very passionate about this because I have spent a lot of sleepless nights uh, doing this kind of stuff. I'm going to kind of go over some basics on incident response plans and the importance of that. I tried to tailor this to the state of California. I'm kind of all over it. But I, I, in, a, in a way, it's really the same. Really about building something that works up and down laterally across the organization. And so, if you look at the bottom, these are sort of the sort of the framework of incident response at the bottom. It's fairly well adopted across most organizations. Uh, alert and scope. You get, you get the first word. In my case, the first word the Navy was hacked because we were. I was in the beach in the Outer Banks. And I was told to come back because we had gotten this alert. Not from our own sim on our own systems, uh, which is another discussion in and of itself. Um, but from our national security partners um, and the intelligence apparatus that is very helpful for Department of Defense and other agencies. You get that, and you got to wrestle, you got to investigate, figure out what's going on. This is largely a technical activity. This is why it kind of refers to the technical because they have the most knowledge initially of what's going on in the organization. What, what's happening here? What's the impact of this? Nobody can really do that except for the technical forensics team. So you have to have that contained. Obviously, now that you have an understanding and awareness of what has happened, in some cases, you don't know exactly what happened. But you have to contain it. And this is where this intersection between the technical and the rest of the organization happens, largely in the contained segment. Why? Because some, this is really annoying. Is, is this could this be just turned off because it's echoing? Um, why? Because in some cases, contained means the technical guys will raise their hand and say, you gotta stop the bleeding, shut it off. Well, wait a minute, time out. In some cases, that's not the right answer. Uh, in some cases, the impact of that uh, may not be as bad as the impact of turning it off, whatever it is, whatever it is. In the case of the US Navy, we actually left systems online because we, were, we would have a greater impact on the US Navy from our mission perspective than had we taken that, simply taken that system offline. So when I talk about incident response plans, I think this is the moment in time this is the deflection the, the where the technical teams are finding out a little bit more about what's going on and they're trying to understand what do I do with this, how do I, and they have to bring in the broader organization. If they do not, and I have seen this happen in organizations on the commercial side where they just kill, kill it, and then there they are. Um, that's maybe a good thing to, to do. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying you have to give that some thought. Eradicate and mitigate, this is obviously where you get into prioritization of an incident response. Prioritization is important because resources are scarce. And so you have to think about how do we want to rebuild the environment depending upon the scope, recover, report, lessons learned. And oh, by the way, this is not just a technical issue. This is about how do we deal with our customers at this point? How are we mitigating impact on our partners at this point? And those are non-technical. And so when you take a look at the phases down at the bottom, and you think about who's responding first, which is largely this next level, the incident response team, of which you have a commander in charge of that, 
And organizations do this differently. <coughs> I mean, I've seen it differently across many organizations in state. How many different, uh, I guess we have a, a wide variety of, of state agencies and entities in here, I would imagine. You probably all think about this a little bit differently. That's not bad. I'm just saying that when I show you this slide, don't think this is the answer. Uh, it's just that normally you have this sort of technical response. In some cases, you don't have all the capability you need in all these areas. So you bring in companies like PwC or Mandiant or hopefully Deloitte to bring in some expertise to help you understand what's going on there. And you try to solve the problem at the low level. But if this thing gets to escalate and escalate and escalate, you really need to bring in, and this is out of the uh, SIM 5340 Charlie minimum membership required for an incident response team in the state of California. This is the minimum. Um, this is not necessarily, you know, this could be any, it's like this others as directed. But when you bring in this level, look at the people we're talking to. Uh, we got the technical representation, but we also now have the public information and communication officer. We have the legal counsel. You know, we have, we have other people that have a stake in what you're doing on the technical side. So what I'm going to talk about really is about, uh, and then really the larger issue, which is something that we're seeing in the, I'm working heavily in the healthcare industry right now. So in the healthcare industry, sort of these different lines, these, think, consider these different health plans. How are they coordinating and synchronizing their incident response if a strike against this agency potentially impacts records or data in another agency. That's a whole different can of worms. Um, and right now, actually, very interestingly, Deloitte is working on a, a workshop with five major health plans and a, uh, what they call a clearinghouse for them, where data all touches each other. And they want to understand how they can better communicate with each other during a crisis. Which is really cool because when you think about it, they're competitors. And yet, they recognize that a strike against one could impact us all. And so when you think about formulating incident response plans, this is obviously internal, sort of how you want to think through it. The next step really in all of this is what is the impact across those that are not internal from both a technical and a business perspective. So you have to start thinking about it that way as well in terms of incident response plans. So when I talk about incident response plans, there's two types of planning in the, in the, in the military. There's deliberate planning, the planning that you do in advance of conflict, and there's crisis action planning, that that you do when the adversary hits. Uh, because why? They change their tactics, techniques, and procedures. We are going to be talking about Deliberate plan. Well, I should probably go back to this ship picture real quick. I think about this ship. Who knows who this is, what ship this is? USS oh, Cole. USS Cole. Excellent. So USS Cole is a capital line warship in our Navy. This is the best that we have. So when we think about the Lloyd framework, and I'll put it in there, secure, visual, and resilient is our framework. So, Secure meaning they, this ship can defend itself. I mean, this thing's got it all. Five, it's got gun mounts and fore and aft. It's got close-in weapon systems. It's got 80 missiles between the fore and aft launchers that are vertical launch. It's got harpoon missiles, which are anti-surface missiles. It can defend itself. It's got, it's got incredible defensive capability. It's got the detect capability. It's got spy one radar, phased array that can see 360 out to hundreds of miles, and then when it wants to shoot something down, it passes those off to the fire control radars that guide the missiles in, it can detect. So it can secure itself, it can detect itself. What do we have? A hole. That hole is 20 feet by 40 feet, 40 feet. And half of it is below the water line. What's interesting about this picture is, is well, let me ask you what's interesting about this picture. It's still floating. It's underway. How do we know it's underway? The ensign that normally flies here, import, is flying from the yard arm. It is being towed. 
But there's another interesting thing about this picture that it's probably hard to see back there. This little gray area, this little area that's not very clear as opposed to this area and this area, it's lit off. The generator's lit off. So this ship, by the way, 17 people were killed in that on the Mestex. That's where the Mestex are for the ship where they eat. Despite the loss of life, the absolutely huge hole in the side, the ship was able to light off and it was actually able to power its forward weapon system to defend itself. And so in the Navy, when we talk about the Navy way of, of the ethos that we have, it's about fighting first and being able to have the ability, the training, the plans to be able to fight her. And I've seen this done with success on the commercial side as well. I've also seen the other side where they would they wouldn't be underway with it. it kind of went the wrong. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy it refers to the idea of deliberate planning versus crisis action plan. Um, obviously, when you think about it, um, and I kind of went through these. This is, these are the areas in which you're gathering information, you're investigating, and then we're going to talk a little bit about this in the next slide in terms of escalation. So obviously documenting how your organization does this is important. It's largely through the IT systems that you have. You document sort of the, the alert and scope piece. This escalation piece is the part where we find organizations kind of struggle with, okay, is this, what is it? I don't know. So there's got to be a process for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. The idea of bringing the team together, being able to derive the information to make informed decisions, and the idea of escalation in this piece as well needs to be understood within your incident response plan. The idea of containment and determining and implementing the plan gets back to the, okay, now that I've escalated to this level, to this point, how am I going to integrate with the other parts of the organization to make sure that the decisions that we're making are impactful and are, are making a difference? And so let's talk a little bit about escalation. This is, this is not the right answer. This is just illustrative. I've seen some organizations have an escalation process of eight layers. Um, but here's the point of this slide. It's really about when you detect something, how do you, in your organization's frame of thinking, assign it in terms of a severity rating to understand, okay, if it's this severe, who do I need to tell? Who do I need to bring into the conversation? Because if you don't all have kind of ground truth on the idea of, well, this is minimal impact, I don't need to tell anybody but incident response team, and you make that call, you have to make the call, first of all. It's not wishy-washy. You gotta make the call. Because that, in your incident response plan, and develop the property, you will have inlaid into it a whole bunch of other actions associated with that severity. The idea is then that as this thing evolves, and sometimes these things, when we execute cyber war games, we, we basically execute them in such a way where it starts out as, well, I'm going to talk to CIR 3 in this kind of season. It's very level 3. It's not. We can handle this. But then the next breadcrumb comes into the war game, and it's getting worse and worse. And then they have to say, hmm, now I think we need to upgrade to CIR 2. And the beauty of being able to transpose this idea into action is by doing that, you immediately invoke, if the plan is well written, you immediately invoke the activities of, and the people associated with maybe things outside of the technical department, which is really important because decisions can't be made in a vacuum. And then of course, all organizations will have different views of how to build this based upon your mission, based upon the systems you have, based upon your leadership, what their brothers are. And so, but, but the basic idea here is you need to come up with severity ratings that make sense for your organization. Now, when we do this for organizations, it's not a small fee. We had to get people in there, look at the technical environment, we got to look at the business operating environment, and we work with them, and we 
we derive these kinds of estimatory paths to make sure they make sense. And then we write the associated plans around those. Most importantly, we kind of alluded to this already, is that the incident response plan is not a plan that is just confined sort of to the technology team, even though that a lot of times it defaults that way, and leadership will default that way. So what are you going to do about it? Um, really, it's about bringing in the whole organization into your incident response plan. You have to really understand, kind of understand the legal implications when you take action. You have to understand how am I going to message the external audience when you take actions for internal. And so you have to not only build those technical plans, but, the, but, but for example, strategic messaging, we've seen where they build their plans, where they, are, they have even pre-canned holding statements based upon the, incident that's, the, the incidents that are most likely in the organization, so that there's not this big review cycle going on in the midst of the crisis, and that they can push something out very quickly. That kind of stuff is just not done on the fly. That's sort of, you can think about that in advance and build those into your incident response plans. You know, I've included also the state entity leadership because at a certain point in time, and, and I, I apologize because I'm really not a state of California person, but I would imagine that this person wants to fully get it before this group gets involved in the incident. How do you more coordinate that? How do you communicate that? is particularly important in your plan. Who's gonna, who's gonna be the person to, to be that voice? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about working at, at the end. It's interesting what you find in terms of dynamics and what you have in your plan versus what you execute in the work game, and you recognize, hmm, maybe that wasn't the right person to do that, or maybe we should think about changing it to this way. So let's talk a little bit about some lessons learned. Uh, the way to avoid what is strong is to strike what is weak. So this is this is Sun Tzu. This is this is very old philosophical war fighting. Uh, he is a classic in war fighting. Well, how true is that today in society? I mean, it's really the same. What are they doing? They're really probing around and they're understanding where your vulnerabilities are. Bang, that's where they're going to get in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. Navy example, and I'm going to tie it into incident response. So in the Navy, we have tier one, tier two boundaries on our network environment. Unclassified network, by the way, this was not classified uh, systems that they could get into because it's a paradox. But just for background, the NMCI network is a very pivotal network in terms of readiness of our naval forces. All the guns, the bread, the butter, the people, the training, logistics, maintenance, all of that is unclassified. It sits on this network. It's called Navy Marine Military. 840,000 years. It's huge. So we have a tier one and tier two boundary. A tier one boundary, now that we, have, we have wonderful intelligence partners out there. <laughs> so we're at a huge advantage here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. Uh, but the tier one boundary, NSA and Defense Information Security Agency monitor that. And then that's a dot mil domain. Then there's the tier two boundary. It's monitored by Navy Cyber Forces, 10th Fleet. That's our role right there, tier two boundary. The Navy mill domain. And then, of course, you have point defense, which I call the carry strike group. HVSS is what we have out there on the point defense. Um, these tiers, we had great defense. Uh, we had the ability to detect. Uh, but we did not stop. The adversary got in. He got in very deeply. Uh, I can't talk a lot about that, how we did it, because I'm still bound under the, my letter I signed to not talk a lot about, about that. But it, you probably can figure it out. I mean, the nation state actor, very advanced, take, took advantage of an application vulnerability, got in, was able to get credentials, was able to move laterally, was able to then get in uh, deeper into our network environment, and got into the main control access. It was a, it was a very ugly situation. So, so the issue here with the US Navy was we did not have a deliberate plan. Amazingly enough, we did not have a deliberate problem. So we went right into crisis action plan. And there's a couple of key takeaways as you think about your incident response plan that I wanted to talk about. First of all, do not spare any reasonable expense to come to early and true improvement. 
information. George Washington said this. This is about intelligence. In our case in the Navy, I think we have a tremendous advantage over the solution set. Why? Because we have a national security agency, we have a national information system agency, and we have very strong bonds and, and understandings of movement of intelligence within the Department of Defense. There is no thought of not sharing information other than at a particular classification level. In some cases, we don't necessarily get told who is doing it at a particular point in time because it might give away methods of uh, how they got that information. So, but the information still gets there. And like I said, in the NMCI pack, we found out from the NSA that some of our data was in a red server over there. That that's because they have title and authority to be able to look over there, and that's how we found out. None of the sensors found it. But we were able to at least get the sniff to be able to execute crisis action plan. And intelligence continued to inform the incident response because what ends up happening is it's one thing to know, hey, it's a signature, everyone look for this one. Well, the adversary is an adaptive adversary, especially advanced persistent threat. They will adjust their tactics, techniques, and procedures which they did. And our national intelligence partners, once they understood who the adversary was, could monitor that activity, and that fed into the decision cycle and the planning cycle that we had in our incident response. We literally adjusted incident response tactics based upon intelligence we received from NTOP, uh, the, the NSA. An example of that. We knew exactly what their, sort of their signature was. We knew exactly what to look for. There were certain mission critical systems that we could not take offline. We had what was called a quarantine review board that brought in the business owner with the technology team and we sat at a table and we, we showed the business owner, this is what's going on in your system. The business owner would say, this is the mission impact. In some cases, we did not take that down because like I said, it's too high. So we set up intelligence overwatch on top of that system, largely with the help of our national security partners, to monitor that system in such a way that we could keep it online because we knew exactly how the adversary was maneuvering. It was very, very helpful. What I have observed in the commercial sector is everyone wants to receive it, nobody really wants to share it. Um, you know, it's, it's just a different. It's a, different, it's a different environment. And I think there, there's really great work going on to adjust that environment. You've got the ISACs coming up. Uh, you, you've, got the, you've got, obviously, the NCIC, the, the Homeland Defense, and they're pushing, and you've got now automated ways, of, and it's all good, and it needs to continue. And you, you, it would really need to continue to drive sharing of threat intelligence and information. With a clever strategy, each action is self-reinforcing. Each action creates more options that are mutually, that are mutually beneficial. Does anyone know what the picture on the left is? Come on, somebody wants this challenge. Battle plan for World War II. Okay, so the battle is so straight. Very good, very good, close. It's the Battle of Midway. So really the only reason why I show this is about the plan needs to be adaptable, flexible, and you, well, you need to build in a cadence to allow it to be adaptable and flexible. This is the number of times this plan was adjusted based upon adversary activity. And so, while the plan is good, while it is a good starting point, um, the organization needs to be able to flex the plan. A leader is a man who can adapt principles to circumstances. George S. Patton. There are, so when we, when we do assessments of incident response plans and we look at them from a, from a pragmatic perspective, one of the things that we want to make sure is really called out there is who is in charge? I mean, who's in charge of your incident response, cyber incident response team? Who's going to be in charge when you escalate that up to the next level? When the Navy Marine Corps internet was hacked, Admiral Rogers at the time was a three star. The Navy has admirals up to four stars. The Chief of Naval Operations, who's the most senior naval officer in, in the Navy, basically uh, poked Rogers in the chest and he said, Mike, you are in charge. 
And then he pointed his finger at all of his four stars and he said, he's in charge. You guys support. And so that was really important to do because we had to do some things in the Navy network that were not popular at all. Um, and so, and the other thing is, you got four stars out there who are saying, no, no, no. Who's, who's really on top of that to adjudicate that friction? And there's going to be friction. We can you know, kind of talk about the business owner, legal, your communications team, the technical team. There is going to be inherent friction as to what decisions need to be made, what's the final, and somebody's got us to drive that. In the cases of some of the incident responses I have been involved with since leaving the Navy, this has been a big problem. It seems like it's so simple, but it's been a big problem and it's been coming to light, not just in actual incident responses, but nobody really wants to make a decision, nobody wants to put their fingerprint on a decision, uh, but it's also come to light in cyber work. Um, it's really an interesting dynamic. It's completely anti-me because being a military guy, you know, on a roll in there and you know, you're just looking for that one person who's charging ahead and, and it's been challenging in some cases. Not in all, but in some cases. So the importance of identifying this person. If words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, the general is the blame. So this, when, when I speak about this, I'm talking about clearly articulating what actions the organization is taking and doing it often enough so that the organization is aligned. It seems so simple that you could do that, but what ends up happening is uh, there's a tendency to hold information, to share information internally, there's a tendency not to synchronize with the external parties that you may have business with, there's a tendency to be gun shy on what do I want to talk about versus what I can talk about. Um, this is a balancing act. For, for what is best for the organization to get them up as quickly as possible without anybody outside getting in the way versus, you know, what, what do I need to do to really communicate with my constituents and my customers to make sure that we're taking care of them and they have trust in us. Internally, it's the same way. To make sure that you have mechanisms, cadences, anything you want to send into your incident response plan, there's many ways to do this, Anything you want to send in your incident response plan to make sure that internally you're all synchronized and aligned on. So I kind of call it commander's intent. This is what the boss wants, big picture. All you guys are, are and gals are executing that intent. Let's get together and make sure we're synchronized and doing it in a way that makes sense. That, makes sense. that has to happen early and often. And, uh, and there's lots, of, like I said, lots of different ways to do that. Um, just make sure it's kind of built into that. I should endeavor to acquire as thorough a knowledge of the principles of war and train myself in their application by <coughs> playing competitive war games. This is a picture at the U.S. Naval War College, and there's literally a lot of heavy brass around the outside, and you see these little model ships down here. They used to, and they still have, the floor at the War College, this is Sims Hall, it's called, where they have a map of the, of, of the world down there, and they would literally, the old-fashioned way, move ships around on the board, and, Execute working. Um, so this really is about had we we didn't do it. We had our cyber warriors do it at a very uh, high level on a cyber range that was a DoD range where we executed cyber wargaming with our cyber national mission force, our our our, our combatant commander forces that they did it. But the U.S. Navy, from a business perspective, like the owner of the business owner of the manpower system, never done war game before inside. When their system got banged up really, really bad, suddenly they didn't have any clue, sort of, how am I going to do this? So first of all, they didn't have a plan. The second of all, they didn't rehearse the plan. And unfortunately, we are part to blame at 10th Fleet because we never demanded that we execute a war game. Had we just simply Comment our fist down and say, okay, on this date, we're going to do a war game. We're going to facilitate it. We'll make sure all the players are right. That could have helped us really drive the success of this problem. But we failed to do that. And that was a big problem. So a quick transition to war gaming. The idea of war gaming really is about taking the plan. So 
you have a couple people in the organization who write a plan. Uh, they get it chopped, vetted, uh, changed, adjusted. They take the plan and then they put it on the shelf. And then I think everybody kind of forgets it's there. In the crisis, maybe some remember, they take it out. I don't know. The idea here is, though, is to take the plan and actually exercise it. And to try to, try to immerse the participants in something that is real. It's something that stresses them. It's not about, let's just walk through our steps. It's about, this happened, what do, our, what do our steps tell us to do? And do those steps work? And what we find is, if you take reasonable, plausible cyber scenarios and you apply it against an incident response plan, it's very unlikely to the organization to understand, hey, this didn't quite work out the way we wanted it to. Or this severity level doesn't even make sense. We should reduce the scenario for the severity level next time because we shouldn't have even been telling the boss on this one. Or, oh my God, this was this was completely gooned up in terms of how we assess the impact at the technical level. We should have expedited this way after the you know, all these knowledge, these learnings come out of cycle board gaming, and it does a lot of great things. Obviously, it improves the understanding across the organization. It, it will create tighter integration, as you'll find is that. Some people will say, well, I thought you were doing that. No, actually, the plan says you were going to be doing that. And so it's, it's one of those things where until you exercise these ideas in a real and immersive environment, uh, you'll never really know, you know sort of what kind of gaps you have that you might need to adjust your plan. And so this, is, this is kind of gets to my, my next point, which is cyber working, uh, if done correctly, you know, you come in, you look at the technical environment, you look at the business environment, you design a very detailed, plausible, inject breadcrumb team that exercises the organization in accordance with their objectives and their incident response plan. You get all that, you do it, you learn from it, you change the plan, but then what? So this is a military readiness model. It's kind of boring. It's but this model works for warships, works for the deployment of battalions and army. And really what it means is that you get into this mode of, okay, you've done that exercise. What was changed? Or I'm sorry, what, what do we need to change? And so you, you, know, you enhance. And then you say, well, did this enhancement achieve what we wanted it to achieve? So then you really need to do another exercise to understand whether any of this even makes sense. So you do that, and at the end of the day, you are at a readiness level that the organization is comfortable with. Um, and you've done that over whatever cycles you need to do that. But in the end, what we have found is that there are so many variables that change over time. You know, your people are going to change. They're always coming in. Mm -hmm. I just was in the main session and they were the state of Oregon I was talking about how hard it is to keep people or get people. And when you get them, they leave. So these people come in and they learn that plan that was on the shelf and they get it. They got it. Now they're gone. And then the new guy comes in, he's never seen that plan. And he's gonna probably not see it. You know, he's probably just gonna have to live it. Um, so people change. Obviously technology's changed. Technology is changing every day, it's getting better, uh, we're getting more sophisticated, but it's changing in your environment and how you use that technology is evolving within your environment. The business changes, the models are changing, how we conduct business with our customers, with our constituents. That's always evolving, it's evolving largely because of the technology. And then the most important thing is the, the adversary is adapting and changing. So what's the latest now? It's ransomware. We're doing um, these uh, war games, in the, I'm doing a, a number of war games in the healthcare industry now, which is about ransomware. Ransomware. Everyone's worried about ransomware. That wasn't a worry you know, three years ago, right? I mean, but that threat evolved. And that threat is real. And so if you decide to, to, to execute a regimen, which is great, and you get to a level, you just need to remember that based upon the things I just talked about, Things are going to change that are going to cause that readiness level to dip. 
And so you've got to continue to do this. This is not a one and done kind of thing. The incident response is really, really about iterative, constant training. I don't know if I have a picture of the fireman. No, I don't. I have a great picture of a five inch round going out the barrel of, of that army bird class. Um, but on a Navy ship, we run a main space fire drill every single day. Main space is our engineering space. And why? Because sailors are they just need to be reinforced. This is the real deal. If we have a fire on a ship, it's a bad day for a Navy ship. There ain't nowhere to run to. You know, you gotta fight it or you gotta sink it. We stress the importance of training, training, training. And I think in the cyber world, in the commercial world, you're living the same now, whether you like it or not. So you have to think about training stress testing and, and iterative and adjusting your plan based upon all the changes and the variables that I just talked about. And so, you know, at the end of the day, this ship, through sort of the thinking that I've tried to convey, um, this ship floated, it got back to Norfolk, it went into the shipyard, and it deployed, I think 16 months later, back through the Mediterranean. And I was honored to have this ship in my squadron when I was commodore. Um, and if you've ever get a chance to go to Norfolk, in the mess decks where this has been repaired, the, there's an afford ship's passageway that goes this way. It has 17 gold stars laid into it for the 17 sailors that lost their lives that day. This is, this is the ultimate example of resilience that I've ever seen. So as you think about your plans, as you think about how can we move this, advance my organization forward in incident response. Maybe if you have this visual in the back of your mind, it's called Hope Gaijin in that endeavor. Okay, so I'm out of time. Questions? So in your example with the military um, scenario where you got hacked and you kept operations running, you didn't freak out and panic and shut everything off. By the situation you had in LA where everybody was panicking, freaking out, and they shut everything down. How do you I don't know what I'm to, but I'm with you. Well, I, I think I know which hack you're talking about in LA. Yeah. Um, and so how do you stop public sector from overreacting and over dramatizing and the knee-jerk scenario? How do you put sanity in that oh, I, response? I, my answer to that is in front of it. Yeah. I, I cannot, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of war gaming. Here's what ends up happening when we war game is that we put the executives in that very situation where they are sitting there saying, you're going to do what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then the, when you look at the plan, the plan, well, that's what the plan says, it's possible. Ah, that's what it is. Stop. You know, there's this inject of, of additional information <coughs> from the senior leadership that, that kind of missed, missed out in that other in that case. No, nobody wanted to make that call. Got it. Um, I think that if you work in and you involve those leaders in this work game, which we are seeing more and more of, to be honest, c suites are participating. We did CyberRx Health Plan was a 12 health plan war game that uh, was done last year by Deloitte and it was it was an industry war game, and what ended up happening was there was C-suite involvement. And that level of, that, that elevated sort of the thinking and the perspective around a major event. And how do I really, really want to make decisions in that environment? So plans got adjusted. And, and, and leaders, in some cases, were used. I talked about one more game we had, where this guy was designated in the plan to be the incident response commander just, it was, so nobody wants to be embarrassed in a war game, but it was clear he wasn't the right guy. You know, and, it, and so they adjusted it over to somebody else to make the, the right decisions that the organization needed at the time. So I, 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 it's a really simplistic answer, and I think I can give you that. But to me, to, to practice it in an advance of an event, we'll hopefully get at that problem. Yeah, I'm also new at the States for three 
Thank you everyone, I hope you guys have a 